Hello everyone, welcome back to Satire Goat, the only YouTube channel on the internet that ranks things in a specific order. And in this episode, I put together a little presentation uh, I'd like to call the M. Night Shyamalan Universe Ranked from Worst to Best. In this video, we're going to look at every single movie that M. Night Shyamalan has both directed and written, and we're going to compare them all, we're going to rank them all on the list from worst to best, because after seeing Old this weekend, it motivated me to watch Glass, which is the only other M. Night movie I have not seen. So now, I have been witness to every M. Night masterpiece, and I'm here to rank them. That's right, from worst to best. Number 11, the worst one, The Last Airbender. This movie is ass cheeks. It is flaming, flaming ass cheeks, mostly because, and the reason why I did put it in this spot, mind you, is because it ruins a source material that is so pure, that is so beautiful, and is so unabashedly brilliant. It's one of the best kids shows of all time, so to adapt it into this energy-lacking monstrosity of a film is borderline offensive to me. I grew up with this series, and the fact that this movie misrepresents everything is awful. This is genuinely his worst movie to me of all time, easily, bar none. This movie gets the names of the characters wrong, and it gets the races of the characters wrong. That's not something you do on purpose, and if it is, it's a change that makes no sense whatsoever. Why, why would you do that? How, how much do you like this show, M. Night? Jesus Christ. This is the most stilted acting I've seen since, well, well, the next movie on this list. The dialogue is atrocious. Human beings do not talk like this. And I'm going to be talking a lot about M. Night's dialogue in this effing video. Because M. Night's dialogue is like an AI trying to replicate human conversations. It's just not natural. Nothing he writes is natural. Number 10, we have Glass. I was really torn between number 10 and number 9 because I think one is slightly worse than the other, but I dislike one more. And I definitely dislike Glass more than the number 9 spot, so Glass is number 10. Mostly because similarly to The Last Airbender, it absolutely ruins a source material that is great. However, in this instance, it happens to be M. Night ruining his own damn source material. Unbreakable, brilliant start, split, an interesting and unexpected continuance of the story, and Glass trying to tie it all together. This movie freaking sucks. Ass cheeks. Spoilers. Spoilers for this movie because uh, the main characters all die. They all die at the end. The main guy, the main superhero, Superman himself, David Dunn, drowns in a puddle. I will say this movie did have promise, it was shot competently, uh, slightly less interesting than Split in terms of its cinematography, I would say, but the opening is sort of exciting, it's interesting to see where David Dunn has been after all of these years, a reintroduction to his character of sorts, but continuing from there, the movie just drops in quality until it becomes a 1 out of 10. Oh yeah, The, the Last Airbender also a 1 out of 10. Dog shit movies, absolute dog, these movies are dog. Yeah, just a dog movie. Don't watch this. It's it's it'll kill you, man. This movie is complete dog. It's it's probably called Glass because it feels like getting cut by glass while watching this movie. Hey, got him. Number nine is the happening. Now we're getting into the funny bad stuff, you know. The last Airbender and Glass were like a little funny bad, but I was too outraged watching them to enjoy it. The happening, even though this is also a dog ass cheek movie, and it's also a one out of ten. This movie is hilarious. If you want great, funny, bad M. Night dialogue, watch this movie. All the characters are so bizarre just for the sake of being bizarre, and that's another thing that I can tie to M. Night throughout his entire career. A lot of the characters are just weird and quirky just to have them be weird and quirky, and it's told to the audience so unnaturalistically. Mark Wahlberg will just walk up to characters and say, Oh, uh, hi guys, I I'm a science teacher, and I know that nature is really weird, and Oh, a high pie plant. That's my Mark, Marky Mark impression. What? No. I'm not Mark Wahlberg. I'm an AI that M. Night paid and built to recreate the, the, the human condition. I can make an entire separate video on every M. Night movie just because 
every one of them just falls in on itself in some way or another. And in The Happening, it builds up this mystery, like what is going on, what is going on, and it sets up themes and thematic elements throughout the movie about nature being unpredictable and wild. And he actually has the balls to end the movie with, the plants did it. The plants hate that humans suck up all the resources from the earth and then they just stop for no reason and he doesn't have to explain it because he set up earlier in the movie that nature can be wild and unpredictable and he expects it he expects people to think it's a good ending that's crazy that's nuts all the actors suck uh the dialogue sucks um the cinematography is some of his worst easily his worst to date in the happening because pre to the happening I can at least say that all of M. Night's movies really looked gorgeous. They did, and I'm going to mention that in the future, but from Sixth Sense all the way up to even Lady in the Water, they looked okay. But The Happening, it just sucks, dude. It's ass. One out of ten. Not the next movie. Number eight, we have The Lady in the Water. Admittedly, I haven't seen this movie in years, and even then, I think I watched like 75% of it. I remember enjoying Paul Giamatti's performance because Paul Giamatti is just a genius and he's so relatable in everything that he's in, I think. I think he's such a great actor. Reminds me a lot of Philip Seymour Hoffman in a way. And you know, all the actors are like fine in this movie. That chick from Jurassic World, um, critic and or book critic, whatever it is, I thought his character was funny and I love that M. Night just killed him off. And something I appreciate about this movie that I appreciate about most of his movies is that it comes from a place other than The Last Airbender comes from a place of genuineness. It comes from a place of him wanting to tell a really weird story that his daughter came up with. I think his daughter, I don't know if she has writing credits on the movie, but he pretty outwardly admitted that she had an impact and her dreams had an impact on the story. So the fact that it doesn't make any fucking sense whatsoever is because of his daughter. Still, the movie looked kind of pretty. I remember looking up shots and being like, oh yeah, this still looks pretty good. The CGI is not great. It's not great at all. But ultimately, it's like, eh, you could do worse. You could do worse than the lady in the water, you know? It's, but it, it's still the lady in the water. You're not going to watch the lady in the water. Two out of ten. At number seven, we have... <sighs> After Earth. After Earth is hilarious, dude. I've got to give this movie a 2 out of 10 just to start, only because I think this is personally the maybe the second funniest movie he's made behind The Happening. Will Smith and Jaden Smith are so miserably miscast in this movie. Jaden Smith casted as the, the eccentric and emotional son, and Will Smith cast as the unemotional and detached father war hero. That's completely working against what makes them both work as individuals. It makes no sense at all. The dialogue in this movie is atrocious, and it can almost be excused a little bit because these are like future alien people, so maybe they talk differently, but you get no sense that Will Smith and Jaden Smith ever even talked before said, if you look at this movie, because they have no charisma together, they have no chemistry, you don't think they care for each other, and I will say the scene where Will Smith is talking about having something stabbed in him and not wanting that to be in there anymore is maybe the funniest scene in cinematic history and i laughed at that so damn hard when i first saw this movie um the special effects are kind of weak the cgi isn't great and this is obviously a movie that m night Shyamalan did not have a lot of you know i would say uh, creative freedom over and it can definitely shows and the lack of energy and pacing in this movie and the fact that he just doesn't seem to care about the directorial style or writing all that much either two out of ten number the next one the next one old old is like smack dab in the middle of this list because it does some things right even though at the end of the day this is another poorly written insanely theorized and off, off the wall M. Night Shyamalan movie. It's about people going on a beach and getting older on that beach. And I will say there are a few things to like about this movie. I thought some of the actors, even though the dialogue was some of his worst in years, did a decent job. The main guy, uh, Gabriel Garcia, Gael Garcia, is that his name? He also did good. Um, um, uh, the, the black rapper man whose name, I, I shit you not, M. Night Shyamalan's idea of a rapper name is Mid-Size Sedan. That is so funny. I think I laughed in the theater when I heard that, dude, and when I got that. 
yeah, there's some decent actors, and the makeup and special effects in this movie are actually pretty good. I would be lying if I were to say anything other than the fact that the makeup looked convincing and that all of the actors genuinely looked like they were aging over the course of this movie with, you know, the face makeup, and even the CGI looked pretty decent for the most part. But what I have to say is that this movie, like a lot of Shyamalan's movie, has a twist at the end, and it's a twist that was set up so obviously from the beginning that I was really disappointed when it was revealed, oh, that is what happened, and you can obviously figure that out from what's going on in the movie. The logic of the aging in the movie doesn't make any sense whatsoever either, it keeps contradicting itself with mul in multiple parts in the movie, and the worst thing about this movie is that it is the worst written dialogue M. Night has ever done, I am convinced, because this movie literally has a character who goes up to other characters and asks them, hello, what's your name and your job occupation? And that's just a way to set it all up in the laziest way possible so that when the characters come back later, you already know what they're doing and what their intent is. The setup is so sloppy and lazy and obvious. It's just such an obvious and predictable movie. And from a guy who used to be known for his cinematic twists and turns, it's so disappointing to see that. It's not the worst movie ever. <laughs> ever. <laughs> it's not the worst movie ever. Uh, the ending is awful and doesn't make much sense. Even though it's relatively entertaining throughout the middle portions, I would still give it like a 3 out of 10 overall. Not great. Next up we have The Visit, and we're finally starting to get into the films that I look at and think, okay, these have actual redeeming qualities to them. In The Visit, I think this is the start of a very, very slight renaissance in M. Night's career where he made like two okay to good movies back to back. The Visit is like middle of the road in a lot of ways, it's fine. I wasn't a huge fan of the directing style at all. From someone who's usually known for his directorial flair in good or bad movies, M. Night made a really bland, found footage, camera style movie here. But I will say, the actors and dialogue are actually way better than I remember it being in a lot of his previous bad movies. The actors all seem like they're trying, both of the grandparents and both of the kids seem like actual grandparents and actual kids, they both seem to fit their roles really well, and even though the kids speak unnaturally sometimes, it actually fits in with the character that they've worked to establish naturally, like the rapper kid trying to have a, a good vocabulary and setting up jokes that he tells in the movie, and even though this movie has a really awkward energy, I think it's intentional. I actually think that awkwardness is intentional because of the way that the grandparents interact with the kids. That's that's always an awkward thing, interacting with your grandparents as kids. And I think M. Night almost portrays that in a really interesting way in this film. Some of the themes of, you know, cultural division are, are apparent in this movie, and I enjoy that. I actually enjoy that. It doesn't change the fact that it's really boring and not that scary, but some of the comedy's decent, acting and dialogue are decent, and it shows an interest in M. Night doesn't often show in his movies. 5 out of 10. Next up, and we're getting into the more decent ones now, we have The Village. The Village is another movie I haven't seen in years, but when I did see it, and I still remember this today, and this is how I know it's at least a decent movie, I can vividly remember certain shots and scenes. I remember the atmosphere it's going for, I remember the intent, the setup, the payoff, and I remember feeling the suspense of this movie. I will say the ending sucks, <laughs> the ending does not, it's not great, it doesn't hold up that well whatsoever, and it's contradictory towards a lot of stuff M. Night put earlier in the movie, but the actors for the most part do a really good job, Joaquin Phoenix as always is great and uh, genuine in this movie, that one guy, uh, what's his name, uh, the, the, the guy from the piano guy, the piano guy, Adrian's okay in this movie. He's usually pretty good in movies. Uh, I think the girl is also good I like the creature designs and the cinematography was actually next level I think I think this may be M. Night's best looking movie other than uh, one more one that's up further, but Props to him for the cinematography the use of color in this movie is great. The lighting's great I would give this movie like a five or six also it, it is weighed down significantly by the dialogue because, because similarly to The Visit, it can almost be passed off as an intentional thing that the dialogue's bad because of the time period or the characters, you know, so on and so on. Moving on from there, we're getting into the nitty gritty here of the good movie. There are only four ones left. You know which four they are. You knew it would probably be this four, but the question is, what order are they in? Well, the fourth one, the worst one is Signs. Signs is a movie that I surprisingly took a long time to grow. It took a while to grow on me, it really did. 
I remember seeing the Nostalgia Critic's review of Signs before seeing the movie, and by that regard thinking, oh, this movie's kind of lame, and then when I saw it, I was like, yeah, it's kind of lame, but years later, when I watched it a few weeks ago, I had a much more positive experience with this film. Not only did I find its slow-moving tension to be, well, suspenseful and engaging, I found a lot of the characters to be M. Night, some of M. Night Shyamalan's most realistic and engaging and relatable characters so far. All of them had legitimate trauma that was set up in, in a not corny way. And it was an involving story to try to watch these people who seem to be genuinely nice and good people try to improve their lives and by happenstance there are also aliens invading the planet. <laughs> That's the worst part of the movie, I would say, is the alien stuff, the CGI for them, not great, does not hold up at all, and I don't really find it that scary. Even though it's a horror suspense film at heart, I don't find it scary. I think the best part of this movie are the dramatic familial elements. I think that it's a really well-written family. Uh, Mel Gibson is perhaps at his best here. This very may well be Mel Gibson's best role to date because he is immersed in this character. He becomes completely immersed and I see the character instead of him. I see this reverend who is so emotional and, and driven to such a sad and morose place by the death of his wife that he loses his faith and he's dealing with that a lot. And I, I like M. Night this one has an interesting story about almost being able to play baseball, but not quite getting there. And this family is driven closer together uh, by the end of this movie throughout the alien invasion. And it's a decent, decent story, even though a lot of criticisms, such as the bad CGI, the lack of logical consistency in the ending with the water, what the hell is that? Earth is made out of water. The atmosphere is like 70% water, you dumbasses. That's a dog part of this movie. I'd still give it a positive score, I'd still give it a 6 out of 10. Number 3, nitty gritty here baby, it's Split. Split is a good ass movie guys. Split, even though I will say upfront, even though it may be a little offensive, slightly so, to people who have quote unquote multiple personality disorder, which is, believe it or not, an outdated term, I believe they prefer to go by the term and good for them and F this movie for <laughs> using that and demonizing people with that disorder or that mental condition because it really shouldn't be something that's demonized. With that being said though, this movie is a very tight screenplay from top to bottom. Uh, there's a lot of tension in this movie, a lot of suspense. James McAvoy gives one of the best performances of the decade. He really does. He embodies a different character with, with each personality or each human being that he portrays. It's so ingenious to watch him switch between character to character to character and pull off every single one. Anya Taylor-Joy, it's just a wonderful straight girl as an actress, and what I mean by that is that she's so good at reacting to things. She was great at that in The Witch, she was great at that here, she's great at that in The Queen's Gambit. Just watching her react to, to James McAvoy's stunts and his character performances, and the way that she's able to manipulate him slightly and manipulate some of his personalities, it's such an intriguing portion of the movie, and it's a great element in it. I like the therapist character, uh, the other girls were kind of bland, kind of boring, but they're, they were just there to be murdered anyways, let's be honest. And this also maths out a distinct change in pace for M. Night's directorial style, his cinematography. Uh, the cinematography in this movie is slow, it's steady, like it previously is in other movies, but it's also flashy when it needs to be, it's really close up, and in other films where the camera's typically far away and moving in on characters, the, the frame often starts on characters in this film and moves back. It's an interesting change of pace, I like the cinematography, the acting is superb for the most part, the dialogue also, uh, similar, similarly to other movies, isn't great all the time, but it can be passed off that James McAvoy's character is a troubled man who has issues speaking to people, so it makes sense that he would talk like that. I would say literally unlike any other M. Night movie, this movie actually has some slightly scary, tense portions that makes you feel for the characters and on first watch makes you worry what's gonna happen. And unlike any other M. Night movie, the twist isn't flashy whatsoever. It's not showing off to the audience. It's a very subtle moment near the end of the movie, after the credits, or after the title card at least, where you think, whoa, I can't believe that happened. And it completely rejuvenates you, and it makes you want to rewatch the movie and see how that changes everything in it. I would give it a 7 out of 10. Uh, some pacing issues and some acting issues, and some of the insensitivity keeps it from being a truly great movie. We've seen movies like this before, but it's good. 7 out of 10. Next up, which one's it gonna be? Which one's number two, and which one's number one? 
I've been working so long in this video. I don't want to build up the suspense. I'm just going to tell you. Number two is the Sixth Sense. I have an unpopular opinion with the Sixth Sense, and it's that I think Unbreakable's better. That's simply it, because they're both great movies. The Sixth Sense is a great movie, and it's a cinematic classic for so many reasons. Do I even really have to talk about it? Bruce Willis gives one of his most subtle performances loss with his wife. He's dealing with loss at his job. His entire character is just someone who experiences loss and pain and tragedy over and over and over again, and it makes him an engaging protagonist to be sure. The way that M. Night is able to keep the twist hidden and make you want to rewatch the movie is once again present here. It's such a great, great twist, and it's such a brilliantly mapped out movie. Once you watch this movie a second time, a third time, you begin to realize different plot elements, different camera techniques, different dialogue word choices that are just so intentional, so minute, and so to the detail that it makes you wonder, how the hell can someone who's this intricate when writing films make something so convoluted and trashy in the future? Because this is a tasteful ass movie. Everything's tasteful. The acting is great across the board. Haley Joel Osment has one of the best child performances of all time. The cinematography, although it's slow moving and very cool in its tone and its presentation, it's also effective. It's so effective in its use of suspense and it shows that M. Night Shyamalan is a very patient filmmaker because this is a patient film. This and Unbreakable are both incredibly patient films and that's what I give them props for. They're not trashy, exploitative films like his later on films are. I will say that I didn't get a lot of horror elements in this film. I don't think they all worked. Uh, nothing scared me in this movie. I thought that the scene where those guys were just hanging from the, the doorway, it was supposed to be intense, but it was more so like, oh, that doesn't really make sense. Are they just kind of chilling there? Like, they never try to get themselves down. Like, what, what the hell's going on here, dude? And I do think it's a tad long. I always remember being a bit checked out by near the ending, near the third act of the film, before the third act eventually comes around. But it's a great movie. It's a classic. Perhaps the best cinematic twist of all time. 8 out of 10. And number one, my favorite M. Night film. Even though I could argue that Sixth Sense is perhaps a little bit objectively better. This list has obviously so far been my subjective opinion. Everything in this ranking is completely me. Is Sixth Sense maybe better? Sure, perhaps, but I like Unbreakable way more because Unbreakable does something that no movie has really ever done, and that's satirize the superhero genre before anyone satirized the superhero genre. This came out in like 2000, right? This is a movie that was fresh before the heels of the Dark Knight trilogy, the Marvel MCU stuff. It was after a bunch of bombs like Batman and Robin. Superhero movies did not exist in this time period, or good ones didn't at least. And M. Night had the balls to make a slow-paced, tension-filled, superhero drama family movie. <laughs> that satirizes the superhero genre and parodies it in a very serious tone. It's not a comedic movie at all. This is the best Bruce Willis performance, I think, as David Dunn. He's so quiet-spoken and mild-mannered in this movie, it really doesn't even seem like him. The way that he fidgets with his wedding ring in the opening scene, the way that he he's too nervous to really confront Samuel L. Jackson's character is, is just genius. They're genius character moments, and the character writing and the dialogue in this movie is subtle for the most part. Until you get to Samuel L. Jackson's Mr. Glass, who is a, a charismatic, very loud, very brash villain character who talks to everyone as if he's superior to them in every way. Uh, he's got an interesting condition, David Dunn also has an interesting condition, and they're just a great hero-villain dynamic, they really are, and M. Night knew how to make elements of the superhero genre such as the hero-villain element and relationship work so well in this movie but to an extent that it's put in a realistic world and atmosphere. The atmosphere of this movie is that it is the real world. It is Philadelphia, more or less. The raininess of it, the cinematography in this movie, oh, it's so good. All of the cool colors used, the usage of green and purple in this movie, it's beautiful. I think this is his best looking movie other than The Village, for sure. And the twist at the end of this movie is so tragic and, you know, it doesn't really make you reconsider the rest of the movie, but it makes you realize, oh my god, this man's life is over now. Both of them, both of these characters are just ruined by this moment and because of what Samuel L. Jackson has done. The child performance by his son was pretty good. Uh, this movie really makes you realize that M. Night has a lot of just crash scenes, a lot of train and car crash scenes. He loves that plot device, man. And even though there are some dialogue options that are very M. Night, very unnatural, 
it's an unnatural situation, this, this character superhero type film that he does here. All the familial elements are very realistic. The, the divorce that David Dunn and his wife are going through is, is a relatable scene. And it's a relatable character thing also for, for him to be going through. I like almost everything about this movie. I really do. Is it a little too slowly paced in parts? Maybe. It's definitely not for everyone. But as a satirization of the superhero genre, uh, I love it. I love this movie. It's my favorite M. Night film, and it's one of my favorite movies of all time. I, I would give it a 9 out of 10. If you've watched this movie and found yourself to be lost in it before, watch it again and think about all the other superhero movies you've seen, because this has to be, with the exception of uh, Rain Wilson's Super, maybe, this is the most realistic superhero movie of all time, and it's the most unique. I've never seen a movie like this before in my life, and I love it. That's my opinion on literally every single M. Night Shyamalan movie. Oh my god, I hate myself. I hate this video, but it's true. Everything I've spoken is true. You want me to do it with another movie director series thing? Write it in the comments. Have a good day. Love you. Bye.